Madam Chair, Council members and participants, we are now live. Thank you. Uh, one second here. Little technical, oh, technical difficulties, God, just, just give me one second if you can. Okay. Okay, that's better. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and so, uh, dot com. I now note that the hour has come. Uh, Rachel, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on the screen when you speak. Council member Alan Dom. Morning, Majority Leader Parker and colleagues in the public, thank you. Council member Derek Green. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Glad to be here and hopefully we'll have a great conversation and looking for a bountiful harvest for the world. Council member Helen Gim. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Looking forward. Council member Catherine Gilmer Richardson. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues. And even though it's not September, I am looking forward to this hearing, Council Member Green. <laughs> Council Member Maria Sanchez. Good afternoon, good afternoon. And I believe that is all uh, that's on right now, but that does make a quorum. Thank you. A quorum of the committee is present and this hearing is now called to order. Um, this is the public hearing of the Committee on Labor and Civil Service on bill number 200625. Rachel, will you please read the title of the bill? Bill number 200625, an ordinance amending Title IX of the Philadelphia Code entitled Regulation of Businesses, Trades and Professions by adding a new chapter 9-4700 to prohibit employers from requiring prospective employees to undergo testing for the presence of marijuana as a condition of employment under certain terms and conditions. Before we begin uh, to hear testimony from the witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the public uh, to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being uh, recorded. Um, additionally, prior to recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for that purpose. Um, before I ask Rachel, to uh, call the first panel for bill number 200625. I want to ask my uh, colleague, Council Member Green, um, if he'd like to make some opening comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I want to thank my colleagues for being here on this afternoon for this hearing. As many people know, not only members of Council, but the viewing public, uh, we've had medical cannabis in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for some time. Um, recently, the states of New York, New Jersey, Virginia, and other states have actually moved forward with recreational cannabis. Uh, but the challenge here is that those who have an ailment and have gone to a physician to receive a recommendation for medical cannabis 
are able to do so and able to use it legally within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. However, if those same individuals uh, then are looking for employment and based on the nature of employment that they're applying for, uh, may have a cannabis screening and that may disqualify them from getting employment. And so from my perspective, I think from the perspectives of a number of people, this is somewhat contradictory. Now in certain types of employment, we do have to have that type of cannabis testing. I've had conversations with the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce um, regarding employers who may have a concern. Uh, we've been able to address that. And most of the employers who've reached out to me regarding this legislation already are in um, line with this legislation. And so I think this is a common sense legislation to make sure that we are matching um, the perspectives of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as well as other peer states um, to make sure that those who have a ailment when they're receiving a recommendation from their physician to receive medical cannabis uh, will not be discriminated against if they are also trying to seek employment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Council uh, Member Green. Rachel, will you please call the first panel we have to testify this afternoon on bill number 200625? Randy Duque. Good afternoon, Randy. I see your face. You are connected and are you ready to proceed? Yes, I am. All righty, just state your name for the record, Randy, and uh, please feel free to proceed with your testimony. Sure. My name is Randy Duque, and I am the acting executive director for the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. So good afternoon, Chair Parker and members of the Labor and Civil Service Committee. As I said, my name is Randy Duque, and I am the acting executive director of the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, or PCHR. Thank you for allowing me to, to provide testimony on bill number 200625 or the prohibition on testing for marijuana as a condition for employment, which makes it an illegal hiring practice in Philadelphia to test job applicants for marijuana use as a determining factor. The administration supports the intent of this bill and is it is proposed and it's proposed to be amended and the PCHR is prepared to enforce it. This step in removing barriers to employment is important, particularly for those uh, who depend on the medical benefits of cannabis. As the use of marijuana continues to become de decriminalized and destigmatized across the nation, it is necessary to adapt to the times to ensure job hiring prerequisites like testing for THC or metabolites do not unnecessarily prevent job seekers from obtaining gainful employment in the city. The legislation also recognizes that such a rule cannot be one size fits all. It exempts jobs that involve the safety and care of others, as well as current federal and state rules and certain agreements. The bill respects existing federal and state regulations, contracts, and collective bargaining agreements that require drug testing for prospective employees. While it identifies categories such as law enforcement, commercial driving, and healthcare, the legislation also allows for further refinement by the enforcement agency. The PCHR will carefully consider other occupations that are necessary and relevant to exemption as regulations are developed and promulgated. Moving forward, we encourage stakeholders to work closely to ensure that workers and employers alike receive clear messaging about the parameters of this bill. The business community would greatly benefit from comprehensive guidance regarding which occupations are exempt. Likewise, it is necessary for Philadelphia residents who use marijuana to clearly understand which occupations are not exempt under this legislation and may still require a pre-employment pre marijuana drugs test. Miscommunication may mislead some residents into thinking their employer will not test for marijuana, leading to unsuc unsuccessful employment outcomes. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, you so, very so very much for your testimony. testimony. Uh, uh, Council Member Green, members, members of the committee, committee have any questions? Randy? Yes, Madam Chair. Please proceed. Yes, Mr. Duque, thank you for being here and your testimony. Uh, I know my conversations with members of the business community and the Chamber of Commerce, um, they stated some of the issues that you, ra you, you raised in your testimony. Um, considering that many companies that are in the city of Philadelphia are across multiple jurisdictions and needed some you know, time in order to implement the regulations. And that was the, the basis of the amendment, but I also understand from the Commission Human Relations perspective also needed some time to 
adopt um, regulations in order to make this legislation as effective as possible. And so based on that perspective, that's why we went with the amendment date um, January 1 of 2022. I just want to get a sense from you from a drafting um, perspective regarding regulations, uh, if you can give us a sense of timing um, regarding uh, that process. Well, we'd hope to have at least a preliminary draft, um, you know, within a month or so, uh, or to three months. Oh, actually, within 90 days, put it that way. The reason why I it's hard to really tell is because right now our agency is in a transition phase. I'm currently the acting executive director and um, ideally by the end of the month or so there might be an appointment for a permanent director. So we we have to be able to be flexible. May or may not be me. I hope it's me. But anyway, <laughs> within that time, um, uh, you know, like uh, be working towards getting, you know, uh, preliminary drafts and then, um, you know, working collaboratively with commerce, um, with the law department, um, obviously with my colleagues to really look at, uh, carefully start look, uh, looking at like what exemptions, what other exemptions uh, need to be in place so that we can properly inform uh, various business communities and residents. Thank you, Mr. Duque, uh, for your testimony. I'm sure both you and the department would have multiple reasons for you to stay in your position. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Green. Just two quick ones uh, for me, Mr. Duque, just for the benefit of the public. Um, one, first, let me start by saying a special thank you to Council Member Green. Um, you have been hard at work on this issue for a very long time. Um, we want to thank you for taking the lead um, on this issue, and we want to let you know, Council Member Green, that we really do appreciate your work. Um, Mr. Duque, ask, tell me, if you will, for the benefit of the listening public, Talk to them about how you believe enforcement will work and, and will it be complaint based, right? In essence, will like what should would a member of the public have to obviously a campaign to know that this is law in Philadelphia and like will there be a hotline? Tell people um, who are watching at home how, how you think this will work. I envision it working uh, much like um, our ban uh, fair chance hiring law here in, in, uh, in the city. Whereas it's complaint based, we did a campaign when we initially, when the city initially, um, you know, uh, inf started enforcing it, uh, just to make, let people aware. So in the beginning, we just, we just got phone calls to our regular intake line of, um, you know, people who had concerns. So I see it happening very much the same way. They can, they can f give us a call, uh, or they can file through um, um, online. Um, but basically, if they feel that they've been um, you know, they, they've been asked to do a, a pre-employment uh, drug screen, uh, uh, marijuana screen for a job that is protected under this uh, bill, then, you know, they can file with us and uh, where we can investigate. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for your response. Are there any other uh, questions from members of the committee? And maybe if I opened up the chat box, I would see something. OK, I'm sorry. And it looks like uh, Council Member uh, Brian O'Neill, um, who is also a member of the Labor and Civil Service Committee, um, some odd reason he was here. I don't know if he had to leave, but I just want to note for the record that Council Member O'Neill was also here. Um, if there are no other uh, comments or questions um, for from members of the committee, um, Rachel, I'll ask you to call the second panel we have to testify this afternoon on Bill Number Two Zero Zero Six Two Five. Yes, we have four people on the second panel. Uh, Paul. Armentano, Robert Runitsky, Stephen Shane Esquire, and Thomas Jones. Thank you. And now let me close the chat because then maybe I can see. I'm telling you all, just moving back and forth with this this technology. It's, it's all interesting. Um, I see all of you are here and present. Um, Paul, um, how about we start with you and then you just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Uh, my name is Paul Armentano. I'm here to testify in support of Bill 200625. 
for over 25 years, I've worked professionally in the field of cannabis policy with a particular emphasis on this particular issue, drug testing and workplace performance. Uh, my work on this issue has been highlighted in the peer-reviewed scientific literature in various academic anthologies, and I've provided numerous presentations on this topic before academic and legal symposiums, as well as before uh, lawmakers and council members. I'm a court certified expert on issues pertaining to cannabis and drug detection, and I've attended many accredited educational forums on the topic, including those sponsored by the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, the Society of Forensic Toxicologists, DACIA, the Drug and Alcohol Testing Association, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I currently serve as the Deputy Director for NORML, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, a public interest advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. I have submitted, in addition to uh, my written remarks, a PowerPoint presentation of slides as supplemental, uh, supplemental materials for members of the Council. And I really have three takeaways that I want to provide you from my testimony today. One, there's no evidence to support the claim that those who consume cannabis in the privacy of their own home, away from the job, pose a unique workforce safety threat or risk. Two, current conventional drug tests are detection tests, not tests that determine impairment. And three, many states and many more cities and municipalities are moving away from pre-employment drug screening in the very way that Bill 200625 proposes. So this is not a novel concept for Philadelphia. This is a trend that other states and other cities are engaging in. That said, Normal has long opined that employers ought to revisit their drug testing detection policies for cannabis, and we highlight the reality that those who engage in the use of cannabis away from the job do not represent a demonstrable public safety threat within the workplace. Uh, this is simply a statement of fact. Uh, if we look at, for instance, the National Academy of Sciences, which concluded an exhaustive review of this topic in 2017. They looked at 10,000 scientific studies. They concluded, quote, there is no or insufficient evidence to support a statistical association between cannabis use and occupational accidents or injuries, end quote. A more recent scientific review of the relevant literature published in 2020 in the journal Substance Use and Misuse similarly concluded, quote, the current body of evidence does not provide sufficient evidence to support the position that cannabis users are at an increased risk of occupational injury, end quote. Most recently, a November 2020 study of 136,000 employees in various occupations identified, quote, no association between past year cannabis use and work-related injury for employees in any occupation, including those who work in high-risk injury occupations. Authors of the study concluded, quote, to the best of our knowledge, this was the largest population-based cross-sectional study examining the association between past year cannabis use and work-related injuries. We found that workers reporting cannabis use more than once in the past year were no more likely to report having experienced a work-related injury over the same period of time in a large cohort of the working population, end quote. Furthermore, point number two, these tests, as they're conventionally configured, do not possess the ability to determine whether or not someone who tests positive for cannabis is actually under the influence of cannabis, or whether or not they've even used or consumed cannabis within the last few weeks or even within the last few months. Rather, these drug screens simply detect the presence of inert byproducts that are non-psychoactive and that may linger in bodily fluids for extensive periods of time. That's because carboxy-THC, the metabolite that's screened for in standard pre-employment urinalysis tests, is a fat-soluble metabolite. As a result, scientific papers have documented the presence or the detection of this metabolite for over a hundred days following cannabis exposure, long after any potential impairment or uh, due to cannabis has certainly long worn off. 
In fact, even the federal government acknowledges in their own reports, quote, a positive test result, even when confirmed, only indicates that a particular substance is present in the test subject's bodily tissues. It does not indicate abuse or addiction, recency, frequency, or amount of use or impairment, end quote. Again, my written testimony has citations to all of these studies that I'm citing. By contrast, there exists today much more modern technologies that in fact can accurately gauge employees' performance. These technologies such as Druid, D-R-U-I-D, or the alert meter use a battery of cognitive tests such as measurements of time perception and memory recall to determine whether or not an employee is demonstrably impaired while on the job or whether he or she is performing in a manner that is inconsistent with his or her baseline performance. These tests can be administered in real time in a matter of only a few minutes using handheld or laptop technology devices. These technologies are far superior to conventional pre-employment drug screen or conventional urinalysis drug testing. And again, if you go into my PowerPoint slides, I've included more information about these technologies, including a video uh, introduction with respect to the use of the alert meter technology. In short, suspicionless marijuana drug testing in the workplace, such as pre-employment drug screening, is not now, nor has it ever been, an evidence-based policy. Rather, these discriminatory practices are a holdover from the zeitgeist of the 1980s war on drugs. But times have changed, attitudes have changed, and in many places, the cannabis laws have changed as well. It is time for workplace policies to adapt to this new reality and to cease punishing employees for activities they engage in during their off hours and that pose no workplace safety risk. Fortunately, as I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony, some states and many municipalities have already moved in this direction. Lawmakers in Nevada, by statute, have eliminated pre-employment drug screening in the workplace for non-safety sensitive positions. So, has law, so have lawmakers in New Jersey, so have lawmakers most recently in New York. Similar policies have also been enacted uh, citywide in Atlanta, Georgia, in the District of Columbia, in Richmond, Virginia, in New York City, in Rochester, New York, in a number of other uh, cities and counties. And most certainly, I hope Philadelphia uh, joins them. Uh, members of the council, I encourage you to follow suit and similarly enact bill number 200625. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have uh, with response to my uh, written remarks. Thank you. Mr. Armentano, let me just state for the record, thank you so very much. Uh, for that very informative testimony. We're going to hear testimony from everyone on the panel, and then our colleagues will um, ask additional questions. Uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Mr. Robert. Robert, I hope I don't screw this up. Now you have to tell me. Robert Rudinitsky. Rudinitsky? Did I say it correctly, Robert? Come off mute uh, for me. I think, I believe you did. Yes, you did. Okay, Robert, just state your name for the record and please proceed with your testimony. Uh, my name is Robert Rudnitsky, uh, executive director for Philly Normal and co-founder of Perfectly Normal. Um, both organizations are advocates providing education on the economic and social impacts when two commodities, marijuana and hemp, arise simultaneously from almost 100 years of prohibition. I'm here today to talk about discrimination in both jobs and in our communities. In Prohibition days, Philly Normal would sponsor awareness events and marches. The slogan, we smoke pot and we like it a lot. You know, it's hard to imagine, but back then, because of media exposure, we had real concerns about who would be leading these marches because if recognized, we could lose our jobs. And now fast forward to today here in the city of the first class, Philadelphians have enjoyed the benefits of decriminalized marijuana. In fact, most Philadelphians think it's legal across the entire state. But step over the county line into Pennsylvania, and Lord knows, 
Dorothy, click your heels three times. You'll wish you were back in decriminalized Philadelphia. And over the past years, I've been honored to work with Senator Street and his outstanding staff in the process of helping constituents free of charge to obtain their medical marijuana cards. Discrimination rears its head in many forms. As a result of the opioid crisis, doctors are now facing scrutiny. To no fault of their own, senior citizens are now being mercilessly taken off their opioids and being told that medical marijuana will do the same thing. However, there's a serious problem with this scenario. Most senior citizens are on a fixed income. Discrimination in PA is, is very high regarding pricing. It's a pay to play game. Anywhere from three to $500 an ounce, extremely expensive for those on a tight budget and those who have to claim for where every penny is spent. Medicine is paid for by insurance. Cannabis is not. No voucher system exists yet for anyone with lesser means. Cannabis physicians usually start around $200 and are not paid for by insurance. And the cost for the card is $50 annually. Initial costs uh, out of pocket are six to $800 and monthly average costs out of pocket are four to $800. When confronted with these grim options, many senior citizens and those with lesser means choose to opt out of the medical marijuana program and then suffer needlessly. When it comes to medical protocol, I say use the right tool for the job. And ladies and gentlemen, I think most of us will agree that by the time you reach your golden years and your knees are bone on bone and there are no discs left in your spine, the only thing in your mind will be making it through the day with the least amount of pain. Cannabis may change how you think about pain, but clearly does not replace painkillers, especially for those in pain. And on other fronts, the stakes couldn't be higher. Over 500,000 uh, 500, Pennsylvanians have bared their souls, exposing their deepest medical issues through a series of conditions, all needlessly at costly risk of losing their jobs, loans, careers, small businesses and driver's license, as legalization is now being drafted for full legalization of adult use of marijuana with very little thought regarding the severity of the up and coming problems. And for those who have falsely suffered DUI convictions, illegal drug testing, criminal records, and prison sentencing. Adding fuel to the fire, Act 16 fails to have enforcement and mechanisms for those aggrieved patient employees. In the case of a municipal worker in Pittsburgh, the plaintiff was awarded unemployment compensation, but still has pending litigation. In Pittsburgh, contrast between two policies, police still fire personnel for a blood test, while firefighters and EMS have negotiated medical marijuana into their collective bargaining agreement with the city. Soon, we'll have the MSOs, of, uh, the MSOs, the Walmarts of cannabis screening for their employees too. In the case of Nathan Miller, a seasonal picker at, at Amazon, Nathan was very clear with his supervisors about his marijuana usage. When applying for a full-time position, he was terminated for testing positive. In our volunteer work in Senator Street's office, supporting those re-entering society who are unaware that they now qualify for the medical wanna program under the PTSD medical condition as a result of incarceration, helping those re-entering society to enter, uh, to helping those re-enter to obtain their medical card ensures that a positive test does not initiate reincarnation. And there is no infrastructure in place for educating those who are unaware. And finally, for over the past 35 years, it's hard to explain what I have to go through every two years to keep my CDL for my business. I'm fortunate. But what about Brown, FedEx, UPS, and nearly all the, the trucking carriers and more, all restricted because of these useless, outdated federal policies that are costing all of us endless amounts of jobs, loans, and small business opportunities. Making matters worse, patients are required to pay out-of-pocket attorney fees and all expenses in regards to filing civil litigation, all in hopes to enforce employment protection and maybe recover damages. Act 16 clearly outlines blood tests meeting a positive threshold for impairment, especially for those in the most safety-sensitive sens positions. In short, 
Last week's jobs report showed that we had the most employment gain in 100 days of any presidency. However, 9 million people are still employed from this time last year, and many are legally using cannabis. Even the PUC is facing uncertainties whether it can keep its drug policies. Over 500,000 patients have qualified for the right to use medical marijuana card as long as it's not on the job. So where is the harm? Qualified med medical patients are lawfully allowed to consume cannabis and are being discriminated by employers on a continual basis without compensation. Clearly an act of violation. I applaud our fine city council and all the folks who took their time today in the pursuit and ending the madness as two commodities, marijuana and hemp, arise simultaneously almost after 100 years of prohibition. Mr. Rudinitsky, thank you so very much for your testimony and for the listening audience. I want you to know, I know you felt his passion just like I did. And that's probably because he's a constituent of the ninth Councilmatic District and he lives in the ninth. So Robert, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Please guys, I'm gonna ask each of you to hang on. As soon as we get through all of the testimony, uh, we want um, you to answer some questions for us. Next up is uh, Mr. Stephen Shane. <laughs> and Stephen, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. I just saw him and now I don't see him anymore. Let, let me see if he show participants. Let me see if he's still on. No, he was. He was on. Maybe he's had some technical difficulty and he's trying to get back. But with that being said, Thomas Jones. I am back. Oh, you're back. OK, all righty. We can. So now, Stephen, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony, please. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Shane. I am an attorney with the Hogan Law Group. We're 54 attorneys, 17 offices across the globe. All we do is legalize marijuana and industrial hemp. I have been a member, God help me, of the Pennsylvania Bar for 31 years and maintained an office in Philadelphia since 1989. So I offer testimony today in support of this pending ordinance and building upon what the other speakers have talked about. I'm going to focus on two things. Number one, preventing a loss of productivity and needless expense. And number two, shifting the testing to impairment and the presence of THC. So basically, as it stands now, if this ordinance isn't going to be passed, plus or minus 125,000 Philadelphians are going to lose potential jobs. Why do I say this? At this point, plus or minus 10% of the American population about 31 million people are daily cannabis or monthly cannabis users. When you bring that down, that's about 125,000 Philadelphians. As we've heard earlier in great detail, marijuana has enormous hang time in the system, meaning you could have a robust Saturday in March and still come up pretty positive on THC, which is the key metric here in testing. That's really no reason to cost people their jobs. The testing is pretty imprecise, as we'll talk about in a second or two, and imposes a huge cost on employers. Now, for the bulk of my career, I've been a banking lawyer. I shifted over to being cannabis about seven years ago. So for me, everything's got to make dollars and cents. At this point, having employers test imposes an enormous course on private employment and also squanders a terrific source of productivity for Philadelphia and tax revenue, plus creating additional systemic costs. What are they? Unemployment compensation, lack of health insurance, and other social services. It certainly isn't the focus of today's presentation, but we'd be remiss if we didn't talk deeply about incarceration. One in three African-American men at some point in his life will be incarcerated probably for de minimis drug offense. The average cost of keeping a Pennsylvanian incarcerated is $79,000 per year. And I think it goes without any contradiction that a loss of income leads to an increase in criminal activity. It just doesn't make fiscal sense not to pass this. Let's employ Philadelphia, let's employ Philadelphians, and let's have social services go where they best need it not to helping otherwise able productive Philadelphians work. With that, with that ringing endorsement from the private sector of the good work of this ordinance, 
I have an issue that was talked earlier about the gentleman from the National Chair of Normal. There's enormous confusion about marijuana and cannabis. Sometimes our passion in this sector gets the better of us. So let's break it down really elementally. There's three plants, the indica, the sativa, the ruderalis. That's the entire universe of what we deal with. Those plants throw off plus or minus 120 constituent elements that are called cannabinoids. One of these cannabinoids, one, THC, has some sort of psychotropic effect. The other 119 do not. As this statute is written, it would be testing for the presence of marijuana, which it defines as the, uh, all forms or varieties of the genus cannabis, seeds, resin extracted, compound, manufacture, salt, derivative, mixture, or preparation in seeds and resins. That means basically you'd be testing people for seeds and resins in their blood. But 119 of these cannabinoids have no impairment whatsoever. So for reasons we can talk about at length in the questions, there are all kind of oil-based hemp sourced materials that are sold over the counter. One very popular one is called CBD. At this point, as this ordinance is written, people lawfully buying CBD on Chestnut Street couldn't get a job on Walnut Street because this thing is overreaching. I suggest another possible metric, perhaps the correct metric, is used in terms of impairment. Um, if we look at the driving while impaired laws of many different states, they look for the presence of THC. THC has a variety of effects on people. Now, the, the gentlemen who from normal can certainly wax quite more eloquent than I can, but there are ranges of strains that go to tra uh, treat all sorts of different ailments in marijuana. There's a good deal of support saying that certain strains of marijuana make you hyper alert and a better driver. Some would argue that it impairs your motor skills, but there is a range of how THC in your system would affect. Before that is settled, I think in the short term to help Philadelphians work to help tax revenue generated to provide unnecessary drain on social services. Let's just agree in the short term to use THC as the metric. All we have to do is look at the laws of different states. Some states have zero tolerance for driving with THC in your system. Six states listed at between one and five milligrams of THC in your system. 32 states and your federal government adopted DUID laws um, requiring actual impairment. That means you'd have to do a motor skills test. The, um, and Colorado, where my law firm is based, we're a Colorado-based law firm, although we have offices across the globe, has enacted a law imposing a rebuttable inference of criminally insufficient impairment if a driver's blood, THC, exceeds five milligrams. So at this point, we should look at the functioning of people having a job. I am an attorney. I, I'm about as dangerous as one can be behind a keyboard or perhaps standing up in the court of common pleas. Other people may be operating heavy machinery. Quite a difference between the two. And to have one size fits all just isn't right. I think a bit more care into an otherwise very wonderful piece of legislation needs to, to be fine-tuned to perhaps separate the wheat from the chaff. And I thank everybody for contributing. I'll be sticking around if anybody has any questions. And I want to give a particular thank to um, Councilperson Green, who's always been at the forefront of all these things. Thank you, Councilperson Green. Thank you, Mr. Shane, for your testimony. We greatly appreciate it. Um, uh, Mr. Thomas Jones, is Thomas still on with us? Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Thomas Jones. I was speaking as a private citizen and as someone who this bill would directly affect. Uh, I'm a resident of Philadelphia and I graduate of the uh, of 2018 Saga University with a BA degree in psychology. And I've been diagnosed with ADHD, Tress syndrome, and and PDD-NOS, which is a condition on the autism spectrum 
that's characterized by impairment in the development of social interactions and verbal and nonverbal communications. I have been registered with the Pennsylvania State Department, State Department of Health as a medical marijuana user since 2018, and I am unemployed. I'm not unemployed because I do not look for work. I'm not unemployed because I'm not a capable person. I'm unemployed because I use medical marijuana legally to treat a medical condition for which there is no cure or perspective. <laughs> There is no cure or prescription therapy treatment, and I cannot pass an unemployment drug test for marijuana. The short version is that medical marijuana helps me deal with the issues surrounding my autism spectrum condition, and as an added benefit, medical marijuana has greatly has greatly helped in the reduction of my motor of, of my motor of my motor verbal tics and my sleeping and eating issues that I believe were initially caused by my decade long use of ADD and trust medications. Without medical marijuana, I believe my health would be much worse and my inability to socially interact with people and my limited verbal and nonverbal communication skills would make it nearly impossible to secure and hold a full-time job. I apply to jobs almost every day. The robot comes when they do a drug test. One potential employer wanted to hire me. She even took my case to her corporate office. They had no plan in place to deal with potential good employment candidates who were authorized medical marijuana users. Even in cities where medical marijuana and even recreational marijuana are, mm, marijuana are legal, these companies will still require drug testing, which includes everything from marijuana prescription medications to heroin, cocaine, or more. These companies will accept you if you can provide proof of prescriptions, but you are automatically rejected if you test positive for hard drugs or marijuana, even if it is medical marijuana and you are an authorized user. Uh, I just wanted to speak because this is something that will directly affect me, and I wanted to make sure that you would have a a view of someone that's going to impact. Thank you, Thomas, so very much for your testimony. Um, you have a very a moving story and um, want to thank you for just the courage um, to be here today to share your story uh, with Philadelphia. Um, Chair recognizes Council uh, Member Green to lead us in questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank um, all of the witnesses who testified this afternoon. I would like to initially start with Thomas. Um, we um, reconnected when you reached out to me in reference to this legislation, um, but you, were, you reminded me that we first met um, at uh, LaSalle University when you were, I believe you were a student at that time. I spoke at an autism conference at LaSalle as part of the latter program. And I think you provided some information and I wanna thank you for you know, speaking out in reference to how this issue has impacted you um, specifically. And if you could provide a little more perspective, if you're willing to share in reference to what the dynamics have been when you have applied for various positions uh, and what some of the feedback has been when you've either chose to disclose or not disclose um, the fact you use um, this type of treatment to help you with your uh, learning difference. Uh, I'd be happy to share. Um, when I first got my card and I decided to apply, I was completely upfront about it. I was happy, I was excited, I thought I was doing the correct thing. But as soon as I brought it up, they didn't know how to handle it. It was the grandpa's at the card, but they don't know what they didn't have anything yet on or they have anything in their in their uh system for how to handle this. Um so a lot of times it would just be, well, we can't go any further with this. They very brush it aside. Um after multiple times of, of no, after I noticed that it was when the drug testing came up, when I, or when I offered it, I started to, I wouldn't bring it up unless the drug, unless the topic of a drug test came up, and even then, uh, I was going to have to take tests even after sending them the card, and as soon as it showed that I had a, that I tested positive for the drug test, they would, they we can't hire you, even though I had the card with me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We're sharing that because I think that this typifies what this um, purpose is legislation is showing that those who receive a recommendation from a physician for this type of medication uh, because it's helping them to live a more quality of life and more uh, impactful life but then just because they receive that type of recommendation from a physician totally allowed within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and numerous states around the nation but then when, a, when individuals try to get employed like yourself, they're being discriminated against because of the fact that we're still using a uh, detection type of perspective regarding screening for those who want prospective employment. 
Um, my next five question, and if either for you, Tom, or for any other witnesses that are here, um, and it was spoken to earlier in all of the testimonies that we're now moving into a phase of um, transition from what cannabis was treated as for a number of years, decades, to where it is now. And it's still based on a uh, detection perspective as opposed to impairment. Uh, when Mr. Shane was talking about uh, impairment tests, it brought me back to, you know, when I was in um, Attorney General's office in Delaware, and you know, some people are not taking any type or did not blow into any type of um, machine in reference to their sobriety and had to do a field sobriety test, and so that is based on whether that person is impaired or not, and that's really the movement we should be going in, whether someone was impaired as opposed to something being detected in their system because i think the general public do not have an understanding that um even thc can be in your system for a very very long time regardless if it has any impairment impact on you or not as compared to alcohol which has a different perspective in reference to how alcohol metabolizes in your system so i'm just curious from um any of the uh, witnesses here how are we moving forward from a detection perspective to impairment perspective, not only from a criminal law, but also employment as well. Uh, this is Paul Armentano. I'd be happy to uh, weigh in on that. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, this distinction is crucial, uh, particularly in legal jurisdictions where cannabis, whether it's for medical purposes or adult use purposes, is in fact legal. There is therefore a need to move away from detection of cannabis or past use of cannabis to impairment or someone being under the influence of cannabis. The conventional tests that we're talking about, when we're talking about urinalysis, blood tests, or even saliva tests, all fall into the category of detection tests. The purpose of those tests is to detect the presence of either active THC in the case of a blood test or inactive byproducts of THC. And otherwise, after THC has been metabolized by the body, a waste product, an inert metabolite, primarily carboxy THC, may be present in blood, in urine, and in saliva. Neither the presence of these compounds, regardless of the quantity that is detected, is indicative of either someone being under the influence of that compound or having even recently been exposed to cannabis. As has been noted in urinalysis, the primary tool that employers use as a pre-employment drug screen or even an on-the-job drug screen, urinalysis cannot detect THC. Urinalysis can only detect the inert byproduct of THC. That's carboxy THC. Carboxy THC is only present in quantities after THC, after, after the active ingredient in cannabis has been metabolized. So I, I like to call urinalysis an unimpairment test because you only get carboxy T after THC has already been metabolized. We know that THC is psychoactive, but carboxy THC is not. Carboxy THC can be detected in urine for weeks, even months after past exposure. It is self-evidently not a determination of impairment or recency of use. Neither again is blood testing, which does have a shorter window of detection, but a window of detection that may be as long as one week after past exposure. In the cases of saliva testing, metabolites can be detected for many hours after past use. Again, none of these are impairment tests. The sort of impairment or performance testing technology that I mentioned in my testimony, like Druid, like Alert Meter, these are handheld technologies that use a battery of scientifically validated tests, tests that we know when one is under the influence of cannabis, they differ in their performance. So things like short-term memory recall, uh, perception of the passing of time, these are the sort of battery of cognitive tests that are used by these platforms. 
a person has a baseline performance on these devices, and then if they are suspected to be under the influence, they perform on these same devices, and their performance is there, then compared to their baseline performance to see if there are similarities or differences. This sort of technology is already being used in the workplace. I think it is going to become more popular uh, as time moves on. And again, as there's a better understanding that the conventional technology and tests that are used don't meet the definition of a performance or an impairment test. They simply detect for compounds that are not specific to when one may have last used cannabis or whether they're under the influence of it. Well, thank you for um, that response. Um, and I would just like to say um, both to Thomas and all the witnesses, thank you for being here. Clearly we have a lot more education needs to occur um, at all levels, not only in the public sector, but also individuals um, as a whole um, to make sure that people have an understanding of this challenge and this concern. And that as we continue to see uh, legislation that occurs um, throughout the nation uh, regarding medical cannabis, that we're also going to need to see additional legislation uh, like it's been presented today so that, so that those who legitimately have a need for this type of treatment are not being discriminated against and not um, stopped from getting employment, which ultimately helps all of us in society by having as many people gainfully employed as possible. Uh, it's something that we need here in the city of Philadelphia, um, considering our high level of poverty. And although the focus of this legislation is primarily driven on the employment aspect of discrimination, we've also noted, and Mr. Shane talked about this in his testimony regarding the whole perspective of the criminal justice aspect uh, of cannabis and how that's impacted uh, not only the city of Philadelphia, but our nation. Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member uh, 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 Green. Um, a quick question uh, for Mr. Shane. Mr. Shane, during your testimony, um, you talked about your firm being a global firm, although headquartered in uh, Colorado. You work across the nation and a firm works across the world on this issue. Tell us, if you will, um, what's the movement like at the federal level? Um, to to address this is this issue, um, and uh, Robert in his testimony he talked about the work he had been uh, doing with uh, State Senator Street, who at the state level has clearly um, been um, a leader uh, in this effort. But between the federal level and then the state level here in Pennsylvania, is there any uh, interest in in addressing this issue? Chair Parker, we find ourselves in a conundrum where we have a disconnect between the federal policy and the state policy. So <clears throat> as we speak this afternoon, marijuana remains 100% illegal at the federal level. At the same time, 36 perhaps more states now have legalized state marijuana programs. So we call this the waterfall. And at the top of the waterfall, all that needs to happen is a piece of legislation called the Controlled Substance Act has to be modified. The Controlled Substance Act has five schedules. Here's where things get fuzzy. The problem is if marijuana becomes um, descheduled, if it goes to schedule two or schedule three or schedule four or schedule five, it's still illegal federally. It's still somewhat illegal federally. Now, I'm a lawyer, so I have to muddy the waters. On top of that, like two, consent, two concentric circles, we have the employment law. And actually in places like Pennsylvania, which is an employment at will state, you can fire somebody for a good cause, a bad cause or no cause. In the state of Colorado, believe it or not, it is an employment, I didn't create the law, I just, <laughs> but there's certain, you can't do it for a discriminatory purpose. But generally if, 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 if Councilman Green uh, walks in uh, wearing cufflinks, that I find to be a little flashy, I could say, well, I'm sorry, Councilman Green, you can't work on my popsicle stand anymore. Now, the employment law is federal, and the federal law is a, a little bit different. Even in Colorado, you're allowed to terminate somebody for the presence of marijuana in their system. 
we have a strange overlap and conflict in federal law. That's part of what makes me so excited about this ordinance, because this prevents the testing of it. That's very different from terminating something for having it and the testing of it, especially as a pre-employment device. So if the federal government could work together, and how could that not happen? We all know the federal government works so wonderfully. But if the federal government could work together and say, you know, hey, let's take this completely, completely change the Controlled Substance Act or create a safe harbor and say we're going to take certain parts of cannabis and say it doesn't apply to that. Uh, this would be a very different conversation. What, although we feel it diminishes us in legalized marijuana, it might not be uh, hurtful for Philadelphia City Council to think of cannabis much like alcohol. Can you test somebody in pre-employment for alcohol? The difference being, as the gentleman from Normal said, the hang time for cannabis is so great. And also, if you're a person with, let's say, post-traumatic stress disorder and you use marijuana with some degree of frequency, well, heck, you could have a residual amount in your system. Somebody like myself is a great lightweight. And you could test, you know, I could be 23 skidoo, but a person who's really a, a medical user and, and is in great need of it, they could have a, a relatively high THC uh, amount in their system and no impairment. So it, it, it's, it's rather a slippery slope, again, leading to the enthusiasm, which it really shouldn't be happening in pre-employment testing. And we should break it down to really what is that person doing? But Looking to the federal government for salvation, I would suspect, is the triumph of optimism over experience. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shane, uh, for welcome. your response. Let me just, I'm looking in the chat. Are there any other questions uh, for this panel from members of the committee? Hearing none, let me ask, is there anyone else here to testify on the bill whose name has not yet been called? Anybody here to testify whose name has not been called? Hearing none, I want to thank all of the panels and witnesses for their participation today. We value your opinions. I now invite all panels and witnesses to please disconnect from the meeting. Before we go into our public meeting, we will now pause the proceedings briefly as multiple participants leave the hearing. Thank, thank you. you so much. And Robert, I'll be seeing you soon, I'm sure. I'm sure. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Council. This concludes the public hearing of the committee on Bill Number Two Zero Zero Six Two Five. We will now go into a public meeting to consider the action to be taken on this bill. Um, we will now convene the public meeting. Um, Rachel, will you please uh, call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on the screen when you speak. Council member Alan Dom. Good afternoon, President. Council member Brian O'Neill. Good afternoon, President. Council member Derek Green. Good afternoon, I'm President. I guess you're making me say it again. <laughs> Council member Catherine Gilmer Richardson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and colleagues, I'm here. And Council member Maria Sanchez. Oh, Good I, afternoon. Thank you. I'm here. And also Councilmember Helen Gim, I believe, just joined again. Yes, I am here, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, uh, members of the uh, the Labor and, Labor and Civil Service Committee. Um, we will now go into our public meeting. Um, the chair recognizes Councilmember Green for a motion on the amendment to Bill Number 2-0-0-6-2-5. Thank you, Madam Chair. I offer an amendment to Bill Number Two Zero Zero Six Two Five. A copy of, of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move that the amendment to Bill Number Two Zero Zero Six Two Five be approved. Second. Second. 
The chair notes for the record that council member Dom seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 200625 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries and the amendment to bill number 200625 has been approved. The chair recognizes council member Green for a motion on bill number 200625 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that bill number 200625 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of the council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. Second. The chair notes for the record that council member Gim seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200625 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. And this will conclude um, the meeting. Um, it concludes the business before the Committee on Labor and Civil Service today. Do want to just specifically thank all of my colleagues. Um, I know some of you were actually in two meetings at the same time, but you made sure um, that you were present and allowed us to maintain our quorum so that we could vote on this important bill. So I want to say a special thank you to each of you. And thank you, Council Member Green, for your work. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.